So roughly two months ago, I have did a portfolio update on my channel and this was the breakdown then, um, accurate as of 14th of April 2024. And two months on, um, based on the close of Friday yesterday, um, this is the most latest breakdown. So evidently, there have been some buys and sells and I'm just gonna record my thoughts out here. Um, of course, I don't want to do a portfolio update too frequent. It kind of serves as a digital trail as well for me to log my experiences, my thought process, and so I can look back um, fondly, uh, maybe in the future, five to 10 years, to see how dumb and how ignorant I, I was or um, how smart I might be. Just to make this episode a tad bit more special, um, there is this new podcast episode that was launched on um, Nogus Bank's YouTube channel, and they happened to invite Howard Marks, which is one of my idol. Um, I will basically be clipping some parts of the um, podcast itself to share some of my thoughts and maybe some of the lessons that I had after investing for, I, I guess, in this specific portfolio for close to 3-4 years now. Let's talk about um, the portfolio transition and changes. So as you can see, um, over the last two months, there were quite a bit of um, stocks changing hands. I did exit the four coloured positions in orange, um, namely S&P Global, um, Thermo Fisher, Hershey's and Meituan. Um, simply put, um, I sold Meituan because it was odd lot. Um, it was given to me as some sort of a special dividend from Tencent. I basically procrastinated. I think when Tencent issued out the dividend, Meituan was trading at roughly 181 Hong Kong dollars per share. Um, I didn't really think much about it. It was worth roughly 700 USD back then, give or take. And right after that, I think the Chinese tech market has continued to deteriorate over the last um, year or so. I think I got this share at the start of 2023 and I only sold it like in May of 2024. So I gave it a good um, 18 months to prove its worth, but evidently um, the Chinese tech sector has continued to be a disappointment. Although um, my two largest position is still in Chinese tech, but that, besides the point, I think I don't really have a very good grasp about Meituan um, because I think in my previous portfolio review, um, there were some people saying that I had too many stocks and some of them I didn't really had a keen eye or I wasn't monitoring the business closely. So that basically, um, I basically pulled the trigger to sell it away. Um, secondly, I think for Hershey's, Hershey's, I think there were two main issues um, weighing them down in terms of their stock price and valuation. Um, firstly, it's coca prices, I think. And secondly, it's because of Ozempic and how um, people in general are going to consume lesser these sort of fast foods, candies, because of some weight loss drug that came into the market. And that's why there was some readjustment and uh, I guess some reducing in expectations for some of these even fast food chains, McDonald's, um, KFC, Hershey's, all of them took a hit. Um, personally to me, um, it's not necessarily that I don't think that Hershey's is a good business. I think over the last, I believe Hershey's is more than 100 years old. It, it's founded in like 1800s or something like that. And Hershey's has a very strong brand. I think even people near me, um, they are great I guess, um, loyal fans of Hershey's, they always produce good chocolate, they always produce good flavors. And whenever there's a, some sort of a marrying in terms of flavor or there's a collaboration, um, there is some sort of a premium. People love Hershey's and the flavor profile that they provide. But to me, I think um, it's really too small a position. I'm not very excited about the business. Um, there is still some time for it to turn around. Um, that's why I decided to exit the stock. Um, I still think that the brand equity is still extremely strong. Maybe in future, when I see things start to kind of um, ease off, uh, maybe I would re-enter. I think thirdly, in terms of Thermo Fisher, um, it was really a defensive play. Uh, to me, I thought that my portfolio was very heavy in tech, regardless whether it's Chinese tech or US tech. I wanted some sort of a defensive kind of um, play. I think S&P Global was also one of it. So when I added these two positions, um, they were some sort of a defensive play. So Thermo Fisher is really in the healthcare devices industry. And healthcare in general would seem probably very defensive, regardless of whether there's a recession or not, um, people will still have to treat themselves and the healthcare sector will continue to just boom. Unless um, touch wood, another pandemic comes and it reshuffles the entire configuration. Um, just a side note, for both, for all three, Hershey's, Thermo Fisher and SPGI, I exited with a slight profit. Not because I was gen a genius or anything. I think in general, the market was kind of trending upwards in the last six months or so, um, specifically some of these big names. Wasn't really comfortable ho holding um, Thermo Fisher because number one, I evidently have not been following the company 
very very closely. Um, I'll admit to that. Um, there are a lot of more com other companies that I'm researching that I have a lot more interest and passion for. Um, that's the one of the reasons I haven't been following it closely. And number two, I think um, healthcare in general, whether you talk about those big insurance companies, United Health, Elevance Health, um, Thermo Fisher, Devices, um, Abbott, stuff like that. I think they just don't interest me. I know that they play a defensive role in a portfolio, but I think for now, um, at least for my own personal um, goals that I want to achieve, I don't see them playing a very active role. That's why I just removed them official. Um, thirdly, for S&P Global, it was also kind of like a diversification play. I wanted more financial exposure because clearly I have zero in my portfolio, excluding Chinese banks because they are more of a distress or a turnaround play rather than a pure play financials. I don't really like financial companies. I don't really like insurance companies. I don't really like banks. Um, there are a whole different beasts. Um, they have a different process to kind of understand and to evaluate them. However, I still want exposure to financial institutions or companies of that sort, which is why in my newest edition, you can see that I basically took um, all the funds that I sold, um, S&P Global and Thermo Fisher, I basically transited them to MasterCard. So I bought MasterCard instead. So I think we don't really need to explain too much. I think for Visa and Master, they monopolize the entire um, payment gateway. Um, there are basically railway platforms. There are toll booths that um, take some sort of a tax, a, a blanket tax on all transactions in the world. Um, MasterCard, Visa, they have been one of the best businesses, best compounders of the last two decades or so. Um, but that's it. I think there are considerations in terms of um, valuations today. Um, I do believe it's a wonderful company. Whether is it at a fair price, I'm not too sure. Um, I'm just keeping a tap on it. And hey, investors, now you can get up to 7% in money bull interest for up to 180 days with returns of up to 3,500 US dollars. So money bull is open to all Weibo accounts from June onwards for you to assess easily. Previously, it was only applicable to margin accounts. Additionally, for those of you who would like to trade, deposit minimum 2,000 US dollars and complete three US buy trades and maintain until the 31st of July, 2024 to get 80 US dollars worth of cash vouchers. On a much higher tier, deposit minimally 10,000 US dollars, complete five US buy trades and maintain it until the 31st of July, 2024 to get 400 US dollars worth of cash vouchers. So if you're looking to invest in the US market, consider switching over to Weibo. So known for its low trading fees, intuitive interface and powerful tools, Weibo could be your ideal trading platform. Additionally, Weibo's latest transfer in promo provides attractive rewards for both new and existing users who haven't transferred shares to Weibo before. You can select a right tier to initiate your share transfer and fulfill the maintenance requirement to get up to $1,500 US dollars worth of trading vouchers, plus up to $150 US dollars worth of transfer out fee subsidy upon successful transfer in. So sign up now with the link below and grab your rewards today. So these are just the major updates. I sold um, these four companies. I basically alloc mostly reallocated them to MasterCard. And for the other four um, blue color highlighted ticker, um, I basically added with new capital. So I think I've made a disclosure. I've even made a full-fledged video for these two companies I added. So for Meta and Amazon, um, I had a video explaining my entire thought process on why I added them. Sorry, not Adobe. For Palo Alto and Lululemon, I've decided to add to the position. So I think interestingly for Palo Alto, um, I've been trying to get myself deeper into the cybersecurity space and it's an extremely fragmented, it's an extremely tough and complicated um, industry. So I'm not going to profess that I have deep level of knowledge in there. I'm still trying to understand. I will probably do an update video when I feel that I'm ready to share my own um, perspective in the entire cybersecurity space. But I'm um, safe to say I think Palo Alto is still the king of the entire industry. So that's why I'm parking or I'm trying to monitor the position. And as you guys can see, I do have a lot of 1%, 2% kind of position because they are basically in my watch list. I think that I can enter first. I have skin in the game and then I can monitor accordingly from there on. So for Lululemon, I expectations are being revised downwards. Um, I do think that it's a very strong brand. A lot of people that I see, um, especially corporate girlies and even guys that got brainwashed by their girlfriends to buy into some of these Lululemon products, 
Um, at least over the last three to five years, they have had very strong numbers. They had very strong execution. Whether there's a strong mode or not, um, you'll leave it up to the market to decide because ultimately it's all demand and supply. In terms of my REITs investment, I'm still intending to add um, slowly. Um, REITs have been, I, I guess a lot of all these interest rate sensitive stocks, they are up and down. Sometimes the Fed says that they are going to cut three times and then one times and then uh, many of these REIT valuations just um, keeps moving in tandem or in symphony with what the market expects of interest rates. To me, I do want to build up my REIT exposure um, closer as a basket, I'm closer to 5 to even 8%. It's not going to be a core part of my portfolio. I just want to accumulate very strong REITs that pay out good dividends. I want to lock in the yield. And um, hopefully, there are strong businesses. DPU will keep increasing and I will be able to appreciate um, these um, consistent cash flow in time to come. So, and by now, you should have known I'm a big Chinese tech advocate. I'm a big Chinese tech bull. Um, at least 50% of my portfolio is in both Alibaba and Tencent. Have not lose faith. I'm still holding on. But I think in terms of uh, percentage weightage, um, China on cost is still roughly 70% of my portfolio. On a value or current value basis, it's roughly 60%. And presently, at least in the coming future, I do see myself allocating to other names um, rather than just congregating to Chinese tech. Um, I do appreciate more and more about the value of diversification, I think, over time. But that's it. I think back then, you can kind of argue that when I started my portfolio, I had a relatively small absolute value. And that's why I was a lot more concentrated and I didn't see the benefit of diversification. Because let's say even if you are managing like 10k, 20k, if you put it out into 10 names, um, it means that each individual counter is $1,000. Even if you 2x or 3x, it's not going to move the needle. But as the capital starts to build up, then you can see that there is some level of uh, 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 appreciation in terms of the time that you put into your research. And if you really do 2x or 3x your money, um, you get some sort of a sizable return that is worth your time at least. And I guess my two biggest hit, um, at least over the last two, three years, it's my Meta call and my TSMC call. Um, both did spectacularly well. A uh, Meta because it took a huge nose dive and valuations were dirt cheap. And then there was this huge recovery with um, a lot of all these AI implementations and um, advertising industry just coming back up. I think TSMC was hindsight 2020. Of course, I didn't expect them to um, be able to take advantage of this entire semicon. Um, cycle, super cycle, and this entire AI wave. Um, TSMC back then was really in this down semicon cycle. Um, back then, valuations were depressed. Um, expectations were depressed as well. And it was kind of a proxy bet to Apple because I came to understand of the symbiotic relationship um, between TSMC and their customers. And I came to know a lot more about the company through one of my good friends and a few of the people that I've been following online that have been huge proponents of um, this particular investment. So I'm just continue holding on. Um, I'm not necessarily in a hurry to take profit or to realize this 40, 50%. I do know that a lot of people um, went into Meta with me and they already took profit halfway. I'm not saying that that's necessarily a bad decision. Um, honestly, we don't know. But I guess in my own um, purview, when I look at how I allocate portfolio, um, I do want to hold many of these businesses or at least strong businesses that's going to grow a lot bigger in the next 10 years for the long term. So let's see whether I can keep my promise or not. Oh, and before you guys forget, um, I'll be kickstarting my Fortnite newsletter. Um, link will be in the description box down below. So specifically for this weekend, um, we'll be talking about the top 10 um, Chinese big tech companies. Previously talked about their business model in the video, um, but I'll be ranking them in terms of investment opportunity in the newsletter itself. And of course, um, don't forget to like this video. And let's pivot over um, to this discussion between Howard Marks and Nikolai. You know that in the short run, randomness alone can produce just about any outcome. Is that that's, because also some stupid people get rich? Well, that's right. We all know people. We say, oh, uh, uh, he, was, he, he was right for the wrong reason. Yeah. One of the things I say, the ingredients in success are aggressiveness, timing, and skill. And if you have enough aggressiveness at the right time, you don't need much skill. Uh, now, that, that can make you right once or twice, but to be right repeatedly mm -hmm. over an entire career, now you're talking about skill. Um, this hit quite hard to home because when I look back at my own, um, I guess, you want to talk about track record or whatnot, I've been playing this game for quite some time already. And we always talk about focusing on the process itself rather than the results because like they've discussed, 
in the short term, or at least in some few bets, um, you can be extremely lucky and you can get spectacular results. But I think in the long term, it then becomes a true test of skill. And it comes down to the question on whether you are able to sustainably and repeat the successful process and producing outsized kind of results. So for people that have been doing well for the last one, two, three years, um, you can say that it's luck or even on the flip side, for those of you who have been underperforming over the last one, two, three years, you can say that we are coping and say that we are unlucky. But I think that's besides the point. In the long run, I think time will tell and time is the best judge. What is the mistake that people make most often? And I think it is that once the market is moving in one direction, that it will always continue to do so. In truth, uh, regression toward the mean or the correction uh, of uh, excesses is much more dependable than continued movement in a straight line. Why do things revert back? In cycles, I'm a student of cycles. Uh, I, I've lived with cycles for a long time. And yet, when I got about two thirds of the way through writing the book, I said to myself, why do we have cycles? The economy grows at 2% a year. Why doesn't it just grow 2% every year? Why sometimes mm -hmm. one and sometimes three and sometimes minus one? Sometimes. What's the, so what's the answer? The answer is that people go to excess. And for example, if the economy is growing well for a few years, business uh, heads say, oh, well, we have to build a new factory to get our increased share of the growth in our industry. And so they do, but so does everybody else. Hmm. Now there are too many factories, and now uh, the, the uh, factory utilization falls, and the companies go into decline. Hmm. So then they pull back, and they, and they stop building factories. So straightforward, greed and fear. Greed and fear is, is a good way to put it. And hmm. Just the last part where Howard Marks talk a little bit more about contrarian betting. Maybe you can find times when you think the consensus is wrong and uh, you can do better by betting against it. I want to stress that I don't think it's a good idea to routinely say, well, what does the consensus think? Let's do the opposite. The process has to be much uh, deeper than that. You have to say, what does the consensus think? What do I think? What's wrong with the consensus thinking? Mm -hmm. Why did they think that way? What could make the error of their ways exposed? So it's, it's, it's a very deep question. But uh, you, you don't usually make much money by betting on the thing that everybody else loves. The big money is made by betting on the things they hate, mm. which as a result are cheap, if you're right. Think back to my own personal learnings. Um, you can take it for whatever it's worth. Um, I'm not saying that these are gospel truths that you should abide by. But um, my first lesson that I probably learned is that if you want to finish first, you must first finish. Where, where a lot of people are very urgent to make money. Um, that's why they employ many fanciful strategies like using options, um, using leverage, going all in into one stock. Um, myself included, I'm a culprit for that. But a lot of times when we think about trying to be the first one, um, getting the best year-to-date track record in your IBKR portfolio, uh, because it's a very good flex, whether it's on social media or whatnot, um, if the index is doing 10%, I want to be doing 50%, 70%, 100%. For many of these um, market sequence of returns, you really don't know what will happen. You might really be right, but sometimes you might get the timing wrong. Sometimes your emotions come into play and then you paper hand halfway. Or even if you're right on a position and you know that this stock is going to, I don't know, 3x, 5x. But halfway through, 50% um, you wish to take profit. And then you start cutting the flowers and watering the weeds. So um, there are a lot of challenges in between. And you really don't know how you'll react until the point actually comes. You must first finish and you must ensure that you continuously stay in the game. And my own perspective is that I've seen many people around me um, they talk about going to leverage. For people in crypto, they can go 5x, 10x leverage. And just one small drawdown, um, they are basically wiped out. And then they have to start from ground zero again. Sure, not forgetting the fact that many of these crypto positions can go up 10x, 100x. I can only genuinely wish that um, you don't get wiped out in many of these um, unforeseen circumstances. My second lesson is, if you want a multi-bagger, you need to give it time. 
I think many times I've seen a lot of people um, taking profits along the way. And there's this very famous quote saying that, oh, um, you will probably never lose money when you take profits off the table. I think logically speaking, um, that makes sense. And there is even discussions around it saying that um, even let's take Alibaba, for example, when you bought it at IPO around $70, $80, um, before the tech crackdown in 2019, 2020, it went up to 300 And after this 4X, because you didn't take profit, it came back down to IPO price. See, you're so stupid. You allow the profits to basically evaporate. I think, sure, there are many of such scenarios where the stock basically did a huge rally and then it came back down. And then after a good 8, 10 years, you didn't manage to extract any profits or didn't earn any money at all. But on that same note, for every single company on that list, I can give you another company in another list that managed to continue on that 10x or 20x journey. So the main takeaway here is not to tell you to not sell at all or to tell you to quickly sell and realize the profits. But I think in the longer term, especially for people looking for multi-baggers, um, you really need to give that stock time. I'm sure Baba might look like a joke now because it went 4x and then it came back down. But who knows what's going to happen in the next 5 to 10 years? What if it goes back up again? Similar to many of su such strong compounders, whether it's Tencent, Amazon, TSMC, Meta platforms, and they've all went through um, the test of fire. And I guess um, as investors, we have to go through that process um, together with our investments. Now, the third lesson is it's always darkest before dawn and also dark before pitch black. I think this is the funny thing. A lot of people are saying that, oh, you should buy in a bear market. You should buy when um, there is a lot of fear and pessimism in the market. Um, but that said, a lot of people don't dare to pull the trigger. Um, one classic example right now is in the Chinese tech market. Everybody say that um, everything has changed. This time is different. The Chinese government is this and that and um, how it's not capitalistic, etc. Not like it has been capitalistic over the last decade or so. But that's besides the point. I think when we look at many of these um, zero to hero stories, when investors were willing to bet big um, when the market is at its peak, regardless whether it's a short position or bet big when the market is at trough, when it's extremely pessimistic, um, a lot of people crown these investors as heroes. And because of these huge success stories, uh, many investors will point to these examples and say that, oh, look at it. It's always darkest before dawn. Um, you need to hold through, um, believe in this, etc. But let's also not forget that it's also darkest before pitch black. And um, there's a lot of hindsight bias in here um, for many um, successful investors that made it out to the other side. But we have to also take into account those other stories um, for investors that also bet extremely big in other market turmoils and didn't made it through um, to the other side. So rather than focus on whether it's a bear market or whether it's in a peak of a bubble, um, I would say that we should all focus on the process and try to create a system, um, always reflect back on how it has performed in different market cycles and to fine tune it along the way. Point number four, I would say that cloning is not such a bad idea. I think contrary to many things in life, um, since young, we are told that we should not copy uh, people's work, we should not copy people's um, tests. Um, that's basically cheating. Um, when you go to university, you cannot plagiarize. If you want, you need to kind of make it your own, distill the insights and then create your own product. But contrary to popular belief, at least in the investing space, I think you should shamelessly copy. Um, specifically, copy people's thought process. Um, maybe sometimes take inspiration from people's thought idea. Uh, sure, you can clone and you can buy whatever the other person is buying, but you should still make the idea your own. And likewise, I can proudly say that actually TSMC was not an original idea. I didn't get it myself. I didn't slowly read up and stumble onto TSMC and say that, oh, this is a big company and a good company for the long term. It was really a congregation of many factors. Um, it was uh, a huge amount of it is actually the element of luck. I happened to come across two, um, one professor and one fat fund manager um, in Taiwan. And um, they were basically talking about Taiwan TSMC when it was on the lows, um, specifically when um, it was on the down cycle of the semicon industry. And there was also a few good friends that were in the investment. And through many of these discussions, I managed to get a better appreciation. And that's why I started accumulating shares in TSM. But that said, I think also a word of caution and caveat here is that not all cloned investment will do well. Even if you were to clone some of the greatest investors out there, um, like Munger, I think Munger's um, Baba position hasn't been doing well. 
Um, for Buffett himself, yes, Apple has done well, but he has also other um, not so good investments. So yeah, caveat is there. And on point number five is to buy um, the S&P 500 index. Not so much to tell you to index and passively buy index if that's not what you want to do, but more so um, for active investors like ourselves to track performance. I think it's a very underrated comment. We always see many of these personal finance YouTubers, bloggers, whoever it is, um, telling the general public to just buy S&P 500 and forget about it. But I still know that a lot of us out there that are probably itchy fingers, we think that we are better than Buffett and we want to prove our worth and to create a process or create some sort of uh, investment portfolio that we think will beat the market in the long term. Sure, for those of you who have decided that this is the path that you want to go towards or go down, um, I think uh, just a friendly reminder is to still buy even a small part, a small bit about the S&P 500. Because in the, in the meantime, if you establish some sort of a DCA um, strategy inside it, um, you can at least use that as a benchmark to your own um, investment portfolio returns. So I guess this is just a very simple advice um, for those of you who have not yet um, started buying into the S&P 500 or for that matter, any broad-based index that you are basically trying to compare yourself to. So I hope that you have enjoyed this discussion. And if you have anything that you would like to share in terms of your learnings, feel free to leave in the comment section down below as well.